Hello everyone and welcome to this, the Apple Choral Chill Playlist Show, hosted by Voches 8. Uh, my name is Barnaby Smith and I'm the Artistic Director and Countertenor in Voches 8 and I'm delighted to be your host. Uh, this show was devised because Voches 8 was invited to curate the current selection on the Apple Music Choral Chill Playlist and in order to promote both great choral music and of course our collaboration with Apple, we're bringing you this two-part show to draw your attention of course to the brilliant playlist that exists there on Apple Music for you all to go and enjoy. Now, as well as playing some highlight tracks from the playlist, it's also been a huge pleasure for me to catch up with some singers, directors, and composers of these tracks to bring you a unique insight into the work of these great choral artists. So there's plenty to look forward to. This is a live show, so I'm not certain quite how long I'll be sitting here today, but it could be a couple of hours of great choral fun and insight, and we would love to interact with you all during that time. So please get on the comments thread. You can just come and say hi, or let us know if you're enjoying the music, or indeed have any insights into the music yourself. Or if you want to ask a question, we'll be really pleased to answer those too. So come and say hi on the chats, and we'll be there working and enjoying your company. Uh, please think of this as a sort of quasi-radio show, really. Uh, of course, I'll be delighted if you've got the time and the inclination to sit here for the next couple of hours and give us your uh, undivided attention. But if you'd just like to stick us on as the background music for your uh, afternoon, then that's, of course, also fine. And at the end of the stream, this will be available for you to watch back both on YouTube and Facebook if you want to catch up a little bit later. And as I said, it's a two-part show, so I'm going to be back with the second part tomorrow at 2 p.m. UK time, that's Saturday, uh, 2 p.m. UK time, both on Facebook and YouTube. Now you've just heard, I've already seen someone asking what piece you were just listening to, uh, you've just heard the first track on the playlist, which was A Boy and a Girl by the American superstar composer Eric Whitaker, sung in that video by ourselves, by Votchers 8. And it's time to bring you my first guest now who is a lady who has reinvigorated, I think it's fair to say, the choral repertoire over the past few years with her wonderful choir, the Aura Singers. I'm now joined by Susie Digby, who's the founder and conductor of the Aura Choir, Aura Singers, the sort of, I wouldn't say necessarily new kids on the block anymore, but certainly a, a new voice in the consortium of UK chamber choirs. Very, very nice to see you, Susie. Thanks for nice. joining us. I'm enjoying the fact that your blouse matches your flowers and your sofa. You're very, very it well coordinated. It does not match the sofa. It may match the flowers. <laughs> okay, it, it looks in this light that it matches the sofa, so don't, <laughs> don't give it away. I mean, you've been doing some absolutely fantastic work since the foundation of Aura. And one of the things I love about what you do is you're so invested in create, the creation of new music and commissioning composers. And across your CDs, what you tend to do is select some Renaissance music and then write uh, or have music written that matches. So or as a reimagination, I suppose. And the piece that we've selected on the Apple Choral Chill playlist is one of the Renaissance pieces, but certainly by uh, one of a, of what, by a composer who was pushing boundaries during his lifetime. And that was uh, Clemens non Papa. So perhaps you could just start by giving us a little bit of an introduction to Ego Floss Campi. Yeah, well, um, uh, non Papa was, um, a Flanders-based composer, and he sat between sort of Josquin and Palestrina. Um, the fascinating thing about this setting is that it is um, set to part of the Song of Songs from the Old Testament, which is one of the most beautiful mm -hmm. poems in history. Um, the language is beautiful, the concepts are beautiful, um, and of course it affords amazing material for composers to set. Um, in terms of theology, it's quite difficult to interpret, but essentially it is highly erotic. And um, Clemens non Papa is extraordinary in his ability to convey this eroticism, but also um, some of the theological uh, significances. So he wrote it in around, we think, 1550. 
when he was part of a Marian um, confraternity. So it's likely that this reflects um, references to the Virgin Mary. But it is so beautiful and it is so evocative. And although it's about human, essentially refers to human erotic love, it has these, uh, the, the, this, it affords interpretations, deeply theological interpretations, which have been rethought mm -hmm. over the centuries. Um, Ego flos campi et lilium convallium, I am the flower and a lily of the valley. And uh, the, 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 the idea is that the Marian theme is caudal, and then you have the polyphony wound around it. Yeah. It's quite brilliant, he said. Well, it's a piece that we've never sung in Botches 8, but one, it's actually set for, I think, seven, seven, voices? seven voices? Seven voices, yeah. So one we could definitely take on. It sort of has this, in my mind, it has this position of just being ever so slightly elevated above many other pieces of polyphony. I almost don't want to touch it because, you know, it exists in so many perfect ways, including your interpretation that I feel, of, you know, I almost feel in danger of not being able to do it justice. So... But I think one of these days we're going to have to take it on, especially in the glory. It kind of sings itself. It's so well written. <laughs> well, yeah, OK. Well, that gives me a little more confidence. <laughs> so, um, now, look, just before we play it and we let you go, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about the commissioning work you do. I mean, we as a group have massively benefited from it because we, we often sing uh, one of the pieces that you have commissioned uh, by Jonathan Dove, Vada Chikubo, which comes after the setting by Victoria. So thank you very much for that. Um, Not an easy that... sing. <laughs> Say again. Not an easy sing. Not an easy sing. No, it's nine minutes long. And I think the sopranos in particular have a tough time, especially one yeah. apart. But still, it, a just wonderful piece of music. And Squizzy. actually, we've sung it in Jonathan's presence as well, which for me is always a, a very special thing to be able to do. And I wanted to ask, because I know that you have, you, you found a lot of success with this idea of commissioning alongside Renaissance music. And I know that you have a very big, project coming up which maybe involves that 40 part motet feminalium so it when may you be, yes about. well well on the 21st of august we are releasing a box set on harmonia mundi which is um a sort of tribute to what to 20, the 2020 what is perceived by some perhaps to be the 450th anniversary of feminalium the 40 part motet by talis uh, when we were alerted to this date, um, we, I thought, now who on earth could reflect, who was alive today, who could reflect Talis's great 40-part motet? Various attempts have been made for 40-part motets in those 450 years, and I don't think any of them really stand up to the Talis. However, the, the, the composer we, we dared to hope might take on this challenge, Sir James Macmillan, did take it on, and he has produced the most astonishing 40-part uh, piece, which actually reflects, truly reflects, it's like a sort of newborn spirit emerging from the body of Spem. Um, it, it reflects the Spem in that it is the same length, um, it, it, the structure is the same, choirs one to eight come in in that sequence, and then you have the first tutti, and then choirs eight back down to one, and then the second tutti, and then it messes around a bit, and then the final tutti, to the text Vidi Aquam. It is quite fantastic. And the, it, these two 40-part works, the Talis and the Macmillan, bookend this wonderful program that was curated by the scholar John Milsom, Oh, really? Which looks at the whole culture of commissioning uh, back in the time contemporaneous with Talis. Oh, I'm jealous. With the view I'm that jealous. a lot of these commissions by composers such as Van Wilder, Ferrabosco, Girard, who were around at the time, would have been performed in the Non Such Palace, which had an octagonal hall. Okay. Where it was likely that the five choirs that make up Spermanalium were, uh, were was performed. So it's quite a great an album with a video, binaural sound video, to be released on the twenty first of August. Right, put it bang in the diary right now. 
Okay, that's Thank very, you. very exciting. Now, I've, last time we saw each other was in America, wasn't it? And you were extremely excited at the time to show us a picture that was taken or some pictures that were taken during the sessions. I've actually been looking on the um, Aura website and I know there's, there's a, I'd love to show it actually over this video, there's a picture of you standing in the middle of the circle conducting with these, surrounded by these 40 singers. That must have been awesome, wasn't it? I, I don't, I mean, it's just really impossible to put into words what it felt like bringing this new work to life because the singers were so stunned by it. And these singers have been around the block, they've sung everything. And you were suddenly aware that you were actually making history. Mm. So you had 40 of the best singers in the business anywhere in the world coming together to bring to life this new 40 part work. It was extraordinary. And of course, Nick Rutter's images are breathtaking. So you have that, that visual reminder of history in the making. Incredible. Well, look, thank you. Thank you so much, of course, for this recording of Ego Floss Campy, which we'll play now. But I think much more for the fact that you're breathing new life into the core repertoire. We have so much to thank you for. How many commissions have you made now? Have you? Nearly 50. That? So we're halfway through our 100 commission target. That's incredible. Uh, what a legacy. I mean, we, you know, we talk as musicians, don't we, about CDs being a legacy, but surely... Well, this is the time music. to yeah. be commissioning new music, I think. Yeah. Well, thank you very much from everybody. And we'll, we'll go out listening to the beauty of your direction and your choir singing. So thank you so you much. Absolute thank pleasure. you. Bye bye. Bye.
Susie Digby there with the Aura Singers and an exquisite rendition of that Renaissance masterpiece Ego Floss Campi by Clemens Nonpapa. We of course wish Susie and Aura all the very best with their forthcoming Spem in Allium release. Can't wait to hear that new commission by James McMillan. And a reminder that that's going to be released on August the 21st, so be sure to make a note of that in your diary. It's going to be coming out on the Harmonia Mundi label. Now our next artists do have a piece of Renaissance music in the playlist. I can see from the chats that you're all enjoying that genre, but they're a very virtuosic group whose repertoire spans an extraordinary range of styles and genres. And they were also a huge inspiration to us when we were founding Vosch's 8, and they boast a 50-year heritage of sublime ensemble musicianship. That group is, of course, the King Singers. Joining me now is Pat Donachy, first countertenor in The King Singers. Thanks so much for being with us, Pat. No problem. Now, anybody who follows The King Singers will know that the group celebrated its 50th anniversary a couple of years ago. Obviously, Pat wasn't a founder member. But before we talk about the music, I'd love just to talk a little bit about how you guys, as a brand that's been around for so long, how you go about programming your recordings and your concert programs, because I imagine, well, I know that there's a huge amount of legacy that comes uh, with this fantastic 50 plus year history. And when you're programming, how much of it, the time are you thinking about serving that? And how much of the time are you thinking about forging the group's identity going forward into the future? It's a, well, it's a sort of constant balancing act, I think, for the group, because you, when you join, you take on this mantle of all of that history. And you've got to do two things. You've got to respect and honor that history, which has got the group to where it is now. It's the reason that the group has its sort of place in the world. But at the same time, if you're constantly looking backwards, you'll get lost within, you know, the, the realms of the choirs and choral scenes that have emerged since 1968. So I think it's always a balancing act and we're always trying to do a little bit of looking backwards, a little bit of looking forwards. And sometimes there's ways of, of making the two things meet nicely because there's certain things in the group that will I think never it, it will never lose the format and the lineup I think is one thing that will never change it's quite a signature sound the particular formation of voices mm -hmm. yeah so you know in a very sort of um, basic way that is honoring the legacy in a way by not tampering with that format which is so uh, distinguishable I think but then you know every artist today has to respond to things in the modern world. And I think in every album, every concert program, every project you do, every commission, there's got to be a large degree to which you're responding to the environment and the circumstances that you find yourselves in as an artist, because no one exists in a little silo of choral music. We're living in a world where stuff happens, you know, there are interesting currents within current affairs and, and politics and art and culture. And so we're always trying to respond to those in a way which suits that legacy and that history, which we're really lucky to have. Of course, the group's known, isn't it, also for versatility of repertoire, which I suppose is very helpful when you're considering all of those things. And looking at the tracks that we've chosen on this playlist, they are hugely different. One is a piece of Thomas Tallis. The other is a yeah. piece of Billy Joel. Um, we're going to play the Billy Joel today because it, you know, we're talking about balance. We think it brings a really nice balance to the the playlist so just before you go is there any chance you could introduce that that track for us yeah this this is a song called it was originally titled lullaby good night my angel and it was written by the amazing new yorker singer songwriter billy joel and he actually released the original version of this in the year that i was born um in 1993 sorry if that's a depressing <laughs> fact. um oh. but, but I, I it's one of my old favorites from um from the very first time that I knew the group and it's a wonder to sing in concert these days as well and this is a beautiful recording which features my uh, predecessor David who was in the group for over 25 years uh, who has a lovely solo moment in the middle which I terrifyingly inherited just under five years ago so here's I was ask you, lullaby actually. good night my angel I was going to ask you is this you know I know when some when the membership of Watchers 8 changes sometimes people inherit solos and they do really well with them. Sometimes the solo moves to another member of the group who maybe didn't do it before, but 
does it really nicely. And sometimes it just, the, the piece sort of casually drifts out of the repertoire. So this is one that you've, <laughs> you've taken on, is it? And that you do regularly? We, we, we do do this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, We've not done it for the last few months, but no, this is still in wide circulation. Okay. Well, kudos to you then for coming in and filling those shoes. <laughs> your, your colleagues obviously felt you were good enough and didn't need to give it the chop. <laughs> well, not this one anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> see. Well, look, David's version is particularly beautiful. I know he's a singer. We're both counsellors, of course, and I know he's a singer that we both have admired for many years. So um, thanks so much for joining me, Pat. It's lovely, lovely to see you and catch up. And uh, here's a little bit of Billy Joel, sung by the King Singers. <laughs> Good night, my angel, time to close your eyes And save these questions for another day I think I know what you've been asking me I think you know what I've been trying to say I promised I would never leave you And you should always know Wherever you may go No matter where you are I never will be far away Good night, my now it's time to sleep And still so many things I want to say Remember all the songs you sang for me When we went sailing on an emerald bay And like a boat out on the better than Billy Joel does it especially when it's covered like that thanks very much to the, the King Singers beautiful solo there from Pat's predecessor David Hurley and that great arrangement by 
former baritone in the group, Phil Lawson, and a number of you are writing on the threads that you've sung this piece. It's one of your favourite pieces. I think it's one of those pieces in the choral repertoire which a lot of people have a story about from either having sung or experienced the King singers singing it. I, I have my own story, which is that when I was working with a fantastic Slovenian group who I coach called Ingenium Ensemble, we were making a recording a few years back now, and uh, it got to quite late in the evening on the last day, and we thought, well, should we should we do any more recording? And they said, look, they were absolutely desperate to get this lullaby in the can so it could be on their album. And I remember it's, we probably didn't start it till about 11 p.m. And I remember getting to the last verse and their sopr young soprano Zala was singing the final verse. And I couldn't actually produce it just because I was sitting in the box in floods of tears. And I think we were there till about 2 a.m. Uh, getting just the most pristine version that we possibly could. So um, they've recorded it as well. Go and check, check them out. They're called Ingenium Ensemble. Uh, now, our next tracks are performed by Gabrielli, and for anyone who watches my Choral Question Time show, you will know that this is a group who uh, give a great amount of enjoyment to me with their fantastic CDs. It's probably no surprise, then, that they've got quite a few tracks on the Choral Chill playlist. And now we're going to be joined by their founder and director. This is Paul McCreish. And I think we have to congratulate you before we talk about the Coral Chill because your latest recording, I believe of Purcell's King Arthur, has just won Opera Recording of the Year and I think Disc of the Year at the BBC Music Magazine Awards, very, very coveted awards. So congratulations. Thanks. Yes, we're, we're very pleased. I'm not sure whether it turns to gold, but it's always a great honour to, to, to be awarded these prizes because obviously the in the BBC case they're voted both by the magazine but also by the public so it's it's a particular pleasure we, we love this piece of puzzle so we're very pleased. Congratulations and we're going to talk about Purcell a little bit oh you said personal didn't you we can <laughs> it is personal and the reason it's personal is because we have some poems from the 17th century and the scansion is such that they can only work if it's personal with the stress on the first slide but we're not going to lose you know we're not going to you know lose friendship over it. <laughs> No, well, I remember when I was a choir boy in 1995, it was Purcell's Centenary, and they had this debate a lot that year, as I'm sure you remember, you are probably involved in it, and I thought they'd come out with Purcell. So, but, you know, we, we, can, we can read the books on that one another day. Um, what, one thing I wanted to ask you about this Choral Chill playlist is the fact that you make CDs of all shapes and sizes. In fact, I featured some of your music on my Choral Question Time show in weeks gone by, most recently your English Coronation uh, CD, which has something like 500 musicians on it. But you always seem to come back to making a cappella discs. So is there something about this particular genre of core music that you love so much? Well, yes, it's a, it's a, it is a strange paradox because I would call myself, you know, professionally and by training an orchestral conductor. Um, and, you know, my background was as an instrumentalist. Um, I didn't do the choir boy thing like, like, like you did. So that marks me as being slightly different. Um, and there is something about the human voice which in the end always gets me you know it's very strange i love orchestral music it's fantastic conducting the big symphonic repertoire but in the end there's you know if it's going to be a little tear in my eye it's nearly always a human voice that will get me there so it's, it's interesting i mean i've made 60 or 70 records and i've yet to make a record that doesn't have a singer on in some shape or form I wouldn't call myself a choral conductor, but nevertheless, that somehow that is a very important part of my, uh, my work. You know. Well, I would say that during my upbringing, and even now, your music inspires me a lot, and your CDs are always near the top of my collection. And it's no surprise then, possibly, that we've got four tracks of Gabrielli on uh, this particular playlist. Uh, they're Into Thy Hands by Jonathan Dove, of course, a composer we've both had a fantastic association with. Um, some Elgar, There at Rest, Hear My Prayer by Purcell, and The Child's Prayer by Macmillan. So because you've got so many, I'm going to allow you to have <laughs> two choices for us to play today. So if you had to pick two of those, which would you go for? Oh, I don't know. You can't pick your own recordings. It's like choosing your own children, isn't it? it is, yes. Mercy, I don't have four of those. Two's enough. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I suppose... If we were to choose Purcell and Elgar, we'd have the advantage of having two very contrasted pieces. I, mean, I love the dove, but it's a long piece, it's beautiful, it's almost a, almost a Baroque form with a, a lovely sort of at the end. 
Um, so that's a wonderful. Is they're all they're all fantastic pieces, and Jimmy McMillan's uh, A Child's Prayer is haunting in its wonderful simplicity. So there also there's another wonderful piece. But I guess Purcell is interesting. It comes from the Coronation CD, which you just talked about. So it's just a short piece in this enormous uh, three-hour ritual. Um, and this is performed not really in a historic way, because it's performed in a sort of more modern way, as a church choir would with sopranos, altos, tenors, basses, and higher pitch than Purcell would have known. But it's got this wonderfully arresting sort of feeling as, as the entries, the polyph polyphonic entries build up. Um, it is, of course, almost certainly a fragment uh, of a longer piece. We don't have the rest, but it does work as an anthem short, though it is barely two minutes. Um, a rather wonderful use of the dissonance throughout as well. So that's always a, now, a favourite. Did you give the altos the opening lead? Because as an alto, it always makes my knees quiver. You kind of... <laughs> really soft Great, opening. Yeah. Well, I, I did ask you to sing in this barn and you were too busy. Oh, you could have done it better than anybody. Yeah, it's always that slightly, sure that. It's, it's one of the um it's one of those nerve-wracking things I did about music is that the simplest thing is always the hardest. Yeah. And there's just that sort of slightly nervy moment, you just, know. Um, you can imagine the never a good note eight thousand people, the altos having to sort of sing that entry. And yeah, it's there for altos. Great. And uh, so that'd be the first one. What about the second choice? Well, the second one is um, Elgar setting they are at rest, which I think is a bit of a Marmite piece. You might either love it or you hate it. Um, it's written for the memorial service of Queen Victoria. Um, and it's one of these wonderful little Elgar miniatures, um, which I think are absolutely priceless. I mean, Oh, Harkin Thou is another one that we included on the Coronation um, uh, CD. So um, this is a setting of um, Newman's text, They Are at Rest. Of course, Newman was the, the, the poet and theologian for whom he set uh, the Dune Gerontius, um, his most famous piece. But this is a shorter piece, and um, it's really a rather wonderful conceit. It basically says it, it's a complete arrogance to pray to the dead because they are at peace and we're disturbing their sort of magnificent mm -hmm. quietude. So it's a sort of very strange uh, conceit, but uh, the souls are resting in the grots of Eden. Uh, and uh, as I say, it's almost uh, indignant of one to pray for them because it might disturb their rest. And, and Elgar sets this in a really hauntingly elegant and beautiful way, very still setting, which I love. I know Elgar's a composer who you have a particular fondness for. Is it his, one of his symphonies that you always... Uh, Elgar, is it well, I love them both. I mean, the, the two great symphonies, yeah. I mean, I can love them a lot. Um, it's strange, isn't it? There's always a sort of um, musical racism uh, you know, in, the, in the life of the guest conductor. It's that, you know, I'm constantly asked to conduct Elgar in Britain because I'm, I'm British. Uh, if I ask to conduct it, maybe it's a go, no chance, but we finished to do that. Um, but the great advantages of, of being British is that you, you can obviously conduct them at many disadvantages at the moment. One of the advantages is, of course, you can conduct Elgar and, and Britain and Paul Williams and all the greats of the 20th century, which is a repertoire very, very close. I think as a Conductor, if you conduct sort of choral music, which is often you know relatively short miniatures, uh, with the experience of conducting the you know the major oratorios and the major symphonic repertoires, I do. I'm not saying it makes you a better or a worse conductor, but I think it certainly gives you a very different perspective. Uh, sort of okay, well, I think. Oh, so we lost you a little bit there. I think. Um, do you want me to go over any of that again? That's <laughs> all right. No, no problem. <laughs> I think we got the gist. Of, we got the gist of what you were saying. Um, I think when we listen to, well, well, certainly when I listen to this recording, I hear a great care taken in the interpretative uh, approach to it. And you must have worked incredibly hard with the choir to find the tenderness and colour and which you've achieved. So, yeah, I mean, for me, the most important thing actually is the words. I mean, it's very easy to get slightly embarrassed by the words, especially with Newman. This is, you know, very perfumed Catholic imagery. It needs explanation. But, you know, there are different types of choral conductor and many choral conductors are you know large to a greater or, or greater extent obsessed by sound and vocal color um for me it always comes from word word shapes from the expression behind the words those are my priorities uh, and again I, I think that perhaps makes the recruit make just a little bit different and, uh, it's certainly very very important that the, the delicacy the beauty of the words has to always be yeah, completely agree. Well, look, Paul, thanks very much for joining us. Congratulations 
again on your most recent illustrious awards, adding to the collection, and uh, we will now enjoy your music. So here's uh, Purcell's Hear My Prayer, and then They Are at Rest by Edward Elgar.
Thanks very much to Paul McCreesh and his fantastic group, Gabrielli. Apologies that we were without sound there for the first few seconds of that interview. Just a few too many buttons for me to press here in the studio. You may have missed that Gabrielli have just won the BBC Music Magazine's Recording of the Year for their new disc of Purcell's King Arthur. So be sure to go and check that out. Obviously, it's an absolutely superb recording, which should definitely not be missed. It was actually Paul who introduced me to that piece by Elgar, and if you know Votch's 8's discography well, you'll know that it's a track that appears on Equinox, our album Equinox, a choice, of course, inspired by that recording you've just heard. Uh, now, a reminder that we're here showcasing the Apple Choral Chill playlist, which in its current form has been curated by us, Votch's 8. And we're going to be here for the next... 45 minutes, hour or so, sharing some fantastic choral music as well as hearing from a number of brilliant choral musicians who are sharing their insight into their recordings. We're also going to be back at the same time, 2pm UK time, tomorrow on Saturday. Now, would any choral playlist be complete without the music of Tenebrae? Welcome to Nigel Short. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, can I start by saying, on behalf of, I'm sure, everybody listening, thank you very much for all of the incredible recordings that you make with Tenebrae. I'm sure there's not a core music lover in the world who doesn't enjoy the, your work. And the, I think the pristine nature of your choral sound combined with the deep sense of art that we get from your productions, it's really spectacular. And you've been heralded with praise, I know, in the last decade, and rightly so in my opinion. So congratulations for that. Oh, thank you very much. A wonderful start to an interview. Uh, <laughs> we call it a day there. Do want to go down? <laughs> and I think I even mean it. <laughs> it's always a, a red letter day for me when a new Tenebrae disc comes out. And it's no surprise then that you've actually got, I think, six tracks on this uh, choral playlist and selected two of them today. One very, very well known, Versa Estin Luptum by Alonso Lobo. We'll talk about that in a minute. And um, also Daylight to Climb by Pavel Lukoszewski, which people might not know so well. But before we talk about the music, I'd love just to pick your brains a little bit about this amazing choral sound that you get. I mean, you as a conductor have a fantastic reputation for being uh, a wonderful technician and someone who's able to get an amazing noise from a choir. I wonder how much of that you put down to choosing the singer and how much of that you think is something that you work really hard on. Um, yeah, gosh, interesting question. Uh, can you hear me okay with the I plane? Can, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, good. Uh, I, th I think um, as a singer, I enjoyed working with the groups and with the conductors that, that sort of wanted uh, a sort of fed, um, having a variety of voices and, you know, different colors and a rich texture, but you do need that disciplined, approach to the actual singing once you start going. And so you're absolutely right. I, I handpicked the singers, always have done. Um, not necessarily because of uh, the, the, the voice colors that they bring. Obviously there's an element of that, but I think it's mostly um, down to the attitude and the approach. Um, there, I, I call them instinctive ensemble singers. You know, they, they just, when they sing, they want to get it together with the next person rather than concentrating on their own technique and their own production and not really having an ear out all the time for what's going on around them. Um, and, you know, perhaps there have been people over the 20 years that haven't had the best voices, in fact, I'm sure there are, but they have been the most wonderful ensemble um, musicians to work with. And I think when you end up with a team of singers, who instinctively will put their voices at the service of the music rather than the other way around. You know, here's a bit of Mozart and this is what my voice does and here's a bit of Handel, this is what my voice does. The other way around, the music comes first. Then, then I think you end up with something very exciting. And again, if it's, in, if it's instinctive, uh, that allows us to be pretty organic and spontaneous, even in shows. When we rehearse, we do do nuts and bolts. That, of course, that, that has to be done by every group. Um, to get a feel for, for your rendition. But I always enjoy the performances most, really, where, where we know something really well. And I might just, in the heat of the moment, decide to take something in a different direction. And if the ensemble 
yeah. antenna are all out, then then you're all listening, and and that's really exciting. It keeps keeps performances really alive, rather than you know this is how we rehearsed it, so that's how you're going to get it, no matter how many times you perform a piece. I think that you know all music has got to be alive when you when you're performing it, and having the 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 instinctive ensemble singers in your team is very much a key to that. That's a very long-winded answer to your yeah, question. It's sort of every conductor's dream, isn't it? Very interesting to hear you talk about it because I think, you know, from my perspective, a lot of the time I experience choral directors who, even in performance, are quite focused on controlling the sound. But it seem, seems to me that you're saying that in a performance, I suppose this is the second question, where is, what's your mindset when you're actually standing on stage conducting Tenebrae in a gig? Are you thinking basically artistically completely, not particularly technically at all? Um, I, I think by the time you get to the performance, technically, you've got to, you've got to let things go. Um, otherwise, you're going to constrain performers. Um, you put them in a box and you, you narrow their, the parameters, then, then you're going to get a limit. Uh, uh, there's a limit to what you get back from yeah. them. So, uh, and also, of course, we perform like you guys in all sorts of different venues. Um, and you've got to be malleable. You've got to be able to adjust um, at the drop of a hat, really, on the day to the, the whole uh, group approach, the whole group sound, so that it suits um, the audience in that particular venue. Um, so, you know, the nuts and bolts, you know, the, the they're kind of important in the early stages but when you get to performance you've got to make that music come alive um and there, there are performances that uh, will stay in my memory for a long time over the, our last 20 years uh, the, the most memorable ones are when something is just going so well um that i can just step back uh really do very little and you just see the singers beaming because they, they can they can feel it and you know it's it's bouncing off the the, the artistic endeavors are bouncing off each other and and that's very rewarding and it's very exciting just being in that moment it almost so feels it, like you're being taken for a ride in, you know in a good way because i think a lot of directors it, fear that don't they they're kind of worried that if they let go too much they'll lose control and the whole thing will go to pop but it's just treading that balance isn't it of giving it the choir enough room to go out it's like i was talking about walking the dog you know with those extendable leads and how much can you give them before they're out of control and yeah so that's no, fascinating yes, I, I, to talk about the, the other side of that of course the, the the flip side is that you know when you're on a long tour and you're tired and you're performing the same program that maybe maybe you know it's difficult to just sort of constantly get that that edge and you know i've i very much in, I don't look at myself as a director. I, I, I'm one of the team. I'm one of the ensemble. Yeah. And part of my responsibility is to make sure that we don't fall into that, that space, that mental space of yeah. where, oh, gosh, I'm absolutely exhausted. You know, we've had a 12-hour bus ride, as once happened in the States. Um, and, you know, I've, you know, I just need to get in my bed. And I've got to fire the singers up. And you have, you know, each conductor, each director has their own um, methods of uh, sending messages out to the singers, you know, a raised eyebrow or whatever to sort of <laughs> suggest that maybe that wasn't their finest hour or finest moment. And that, well, you, know, we need, about. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, sometimes just a step towards the singers will, will get those eyes wide and going, oh, OK, yeah, sorry, we're, we're back on it. But, you know, that's that's a rare thing, but it's part of a director's job, I think you know to, to just make sure everybody is pulling their weight and we're all pulling in the same direction all the time thank you it's fascinating to hear fascinating privilege really to hear your, your insights into those things thank <laughs> you um just before we let you go we'd love to of course talk about the music that we're going to play and the first piece is as i said something that perhaps our listeners might not have necessarily come across before unless they've listened to your cd it's called daylight decline by tell me if i pronounce it wrong pavel Lukashevsky. Lukashevsky, I, I think is how, how we would, um, or how I've always said it. Um, yes, lovely piece. Um, I think the, the, the words, um, gosh, it's a long time since we recorded it. I think uh, it's effectively a, a sort of a prayer for the end of the day. So um, uh, the, the most well-known Latin setting that you could uh, liken it to would be Te Lucius Ante Terminum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's very beautiful, uh, very dreamy setting and uh, 
like a lot of uh, Pavel's music, it's it suits a choir that has a very very you know smooth blend, if you like, and mm. and is very well tuned and balanced. Um, uh, so you, it's never top heavy. There's always plenty of foundation from the bottom. Um, and yeah, when we when we did his whole disc, it was the, the, the Pavel sort of slings in the occasional harmonic shift almost with no preparation and that means everybody adjusting by a certain interval by exactly the same amount and it, it can be really quite tricky especially when there's sort of augmented um uh, shifts and, and the, the harmonic changes are not uh, going quite where you'd expect them to so it's it's deceptively tricky um no, to pull off. I, but, I can actually tell that by by listening to it not that you make it sound difficult but i was sort of taking it in this morning and thinking oh yeah, I can hear the yeah. amount of hours in the rehearsal room that it takes to really pull pull some of that intonation into the slot. Um, yeah, I mean, I th th there's always one part in those moments where the harmony shifts. There's always one part that is kind of a leading part and is easy to um, latch on to. And I always say, you know, whatever part you're singing, latch on to that part, the easiest part, and then relate your note to that yeah, yeah. And, and you're kind of all zoning in on the same tonic or the same focal point if you like but yeah it's, it's yeah all, all his stuff i we really enjoy singing and so after that then we've got versa est and looked and possibly one of the greatest pieces of polyphony ever written what's your take on it uh, it's, it is my favorite piece of renaissance music okay. ever um and we it's funny, there was another well-known Renaissance piece of music that we sing an awful lot. I won't say what it is, but, um, you know, when singers see it on the program list, they kind of, um, get, oh, not again. But um, Verse Arrest is one of those pieces that the singers never, ever tire of singing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's just, uh, it's a privilege to sing it. Every single line, every note of every line of every part, is just beautifully crafted. It's there for a reason. It's 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 really satisfying to sing the individual lines as well as listening to the overall effect of, of all these six parts. Um, yeah, I th think it's it's the most divine um, piece of Renaissance music I've, I've ever come across. Yeah, I would probably be inclined to agree with you. And talking about being beautifully crafted, I think that's probably what we could say, certainly of your performance, but of all your recordings as well. So thank you very much for taking the time to chat to us today, Nigel. Always a pleasure. And uh, we'll go out and listen to your wonderful choir doing their stuff. So first of all, Daylight Declines, and then Versa Est in Look. Thank you.
Oh, wow, I'm not sure I'm quite ready to speak yet. What a jaw-dropping performance of, I think, possibly the greatest jewel in the crown of Renaissance polyphony, isn't it? First West in Lookton by Lobo. Thanks very much to Nigel as well for that. Not only that great performance, but also that very stimulating chat about his thoughts on choral direction. Uh, many of you absolutely loving the music. A lot of people, I think, didn't perhaps know the first piece we played there, Daylight Decline. So Tenebrae recorded a whole disc of the Lukachevsky. Luka I'll try and say that correctly before the show's over. So please make sure you go and check that out. Um, now, our next guest holds a very important place in the history of Voce's 8, actually, because when the group was setting out, Chris Gabatas was in The King Singers and gave us a big leg up, actually, with both his fantastic coaching for our singing, but also his support of our business endeavours and setting up the business structure of the group. And he actually took a position on our founding board of trustees. Now, those of you who follow The King Singers will know that Chris recently stepped down and he's now plying his trade as a director. And I'm pleased to welcome him for a quick chat. Joining me now is Chris Gabitas, formerly a member of the King Singers and now uh, the new conductor of the Phoenix Chorale in America. So th thanks so much for being with us, Chris. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, we're going to play one of your choir's tracks in a few minutes. Before that, I wanted to ask, you know, you've come up through, uh, you've got pretty much the perfect pedigree of any British choral singer. You started at St John's College, Cambridge. You've then been in many of the fantastic chamber choirs in the UK and a King Singer. But now you're conducting in America, where I, I'm curious just for you to share with us a little bit your experience about how those two worlds differ, you know, and are you looking to take the British choral tradition to America or are you being inspired by their own tradition? How's that working for you? It's a bit of both, really. I think both traditions have uh, really excellent foundations. In, in England, we're used to growing up with very strong sight singing because the ratio of rehearsal to performance, especially if you're a cathedral chorister, is about, you know, two hours of rehearsal to one hour of performing if, if you think of services as performance so you have to be very very quick with what you're doing in america it's much more pedagogical the approach is more slow burning and people learn more in their teenage years and then through college years um, in order to get to a professional standard what that means is they're much better at preparing really really thoroughly and so one of the main things i find in america is that choirs are incredibly well drilled and the precision that they can get through their performances is second to none it's world beating the difference um, with the English tradition in that respect is that we, we, we have this element of heart and soul and spontaneity that we can bring to things because we're not rehearsed to quite the same level. And I think, why not get both? I would like to work with a choir that has the precision and the clarity of an American choir, but manages to bring a bit of that forward, bright text and rhetoric that English choirs are so famous for. Um, and so that's, that's my sort of theory and principle that I'm bringing in Phoenix. Well, you're, you're picking up a choir, of course, that's already incredibly celebrated and has won Grammys um, recently. So we're look very much forward to seeing what you can bring the, to, the, to the parties, looking for, forward to your first projects. Today, we're going to play something which, of course, is, being someone who hasn't made a CD yet with the Phoenix Chorale, is something from one of your predecessors and a piece of music by Ole Yalo. Could you possibly just share a few thoughts about it with us? Well, the whole album, um, Northern Lights, um, and you're about to play the title track, is it, just a, it's a brilliant album. And Charles Bruffy's leadership of the chorale at this point was really at its high water point, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, Charles had a very organic way of thinking about tempo. And he would really stretch music to get as much meaning from each chord and each melody as he possibly could. And that suited Ola's music perfectly. And Ola was the composer in residence for the chorale around this time. And I think there was a huge symbiosis between Charles's ethos and Ola's conducting style. And it was brought to bear across this whole album of material really, because o Ola sort of devised the, the, the mass that he put together as being a journey from the ethereal heights of heaven and the bodies, the celestial bodies moving down towards earth and the Kyrie, the spheres we performed a couple of months ago. And then this second movement, um, Polka es Ami Kamea, with words taken from Song of Solomon, inspired by the Northern Lights. So we're coming from the celestial point down towards the earth, but still with that sense of space and ethereal floating. And Charles was absolutely brilliant at getting the choir to perform with that sense of stasis and floating yeah, ability. Um, and I've inherited, he captured it perfectly. And that's something which I've inherited with the ensemble. And there, there are many of the singers that, that have sung with the choir for several years. And they remember these projects. They remember how Ola and how Charles worked together. And their 
their real plus point is their ability to sing in this, you know, sort of le jardin sus suspendu way. It's just this incredible suspended, ethereal, breathy tone, which um, which I'm I'm really loving working with. Actually, um, they're such a great choir because they're very much of that community. Then they're, they're not an aeroplane choir where singers are flown in and paid session fees. It's a professional choir for and of the Phoenix area, and they have so much investment and longevity of tenure that it's amazing to work with singers that have this long institutional memory. Um, and Ola's, Ola's music fitted in really, really well with that, fitted in with their natural strengths and their natural talents when working with Charles. And it's something that I hope to continue because it's, it's really fantastic music. Well, we wish you all the very best as you uh, hopefully can get back to your post and start singing concerts again soon. I remember this CD was the first CD, well, the first time I ever heard Ola's music and Robin Tyson, former um, colleague of yours, of course, in the Kingston, who's now our manager, put it on my desk and said, you must listen to this. This guy is up and coming. It's great stuff. And a couple of years later, well, it was I composer in residence. So it has a special place um, in my artistic history too. So yeah, let's enjoy a track. Know. Enjoy a track from it now. This is uh, Ole Yellow's Northern Life.
Phoenix Corral all the very best as their new relationship will hopefully be able to blossom when they can get back to singing, which we hope won't be very far away. That was the beautiful music of Ola Yelo, and we're going to be chatting to Ola actually as part of tomorrow's show, the second part of this Apple Coral uh, chill playlist show that we're doing over these two days. Now that piece we just sung, Northern Lights, is also recorded by Vodgers 8 and I remember uh, standing in the session and just f uh, waiting, there's a wonderful alto trailing note at the end and Katie and I just waiting for it to come up and just having to hold that note forever and ever and ever. So very beautifully done there by the altos of the Phoenix Chorale. Um, now, if I was to sing this tune, I think you would all know who I was talking about. I'm now joined by a legend of the choral music industry, John Rutter. Thank you very much for being with us, John. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure many people watching will know you very well as a composer, possibly more than they do as a conductor, but as somebody who's been conducted by you, I can tell them that you're a very fine director. And before we talk about the, your track that we're gonna play, I'd love to ask just for a little bit of insight from your perspective about how you think being a composer can inform your direction. I suppose also the same vice versa, does being a director help you then compose? Well, I think as a composer, you're always asking yourself the question, how do I want this piece to go because I've written it? And it doesn't take a very giant leap to say, I'm doing a piece by Monteverdi or by any composer you like to name, Bach. And you can't ask them, of course. And so really, you have to go on the available evidence. But my first question is always, how would the composer have wanted this to go? Um, from the evidence that we've got. It's wonderful if you meet a living composer and they're able to tell you. I mean, I always remember dear Herbert Howells. I ventured to do a piece of his at a slightly different metronome marking from his specified one. He was very clear with his markings, wasn't he, Herbert? Well, he was. Um, and I said, well, Herbert, is that okay? Because, you know, it's not quite the speed that you might say, John, my dear, my metronome marks are always wrong. <laughs> On the other hand, um, Benjamin Britten was obsessive about every detail that he had written in his scores being observed minutely in performance. He was a wonderful conductor. Not all composers do make wonderful conductors. Dear Vaughan Williams, although I'm too young to remember this personally, from all accounts was really not very good. Okay. Um, you had to keep together from guesswork more than from anything resembling a clear beat. But on the other hand, uh, in a way, like my wife said when she played in an orchestra for Aaron Copeland as a young woman, she thought, well, you know, okay, he isn't a terribly clear conductor. And of course, there are lots of changes of time signature in Rodeo and Appalachian Spring and all of those. But she said, come on, I'm playing for Aaron Copeland. Yeah, there you go. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that we don't have to use that line when we're singing for you, John. You're a fantastic director, as I think is shown by your recordings with the Cambridge Singers, of course. And we have one of those today. Um, a great piece, a piece that I'm sure all choral lovers will know, called Arbently by Joseph Reinberger. For you, what is it that makes this such a good piece of music? Oh, it could almost have been written by Samuel Sebastian Wesley, um, who's a composer much beloved amongst English church musicians. And I've no idea whether there was any connection between the two composers, whether they knew each other. Of course, here's a question for your trivia quiz, Barney. What oh. fairly famous composer was born in Liechtenstein? <laughs> and the answer is Joseph Reinberg. Oh, yeah. And he wrote this quite early on in his career. Um, he worked in Munich and actually occupied the same post of Kapellmeister as Lassus had yes. some centuries earlier. And uh, it was rather lovely to discover this piece. I think I heard it sung by a German choir when I was at a convention in somewhere in Europe. And my wife coincidentally heard it on a German recording. And she said, oh, John, do you know about this piece? It came along just as I was compiling an anthology called European Sacred Music. And I thought, this is a lovely piece. He was only 21 years old when he wrote it. Beautifully voiced, um, six parts, two sopranos, an alto, two tenors and a bass. And it's got that lovely feeling of evening descending. And the voice parts, as you will know, I'm sure you've sung it many we times. Have sung it, yeah, many uh, times. They, uh, well, the compliment is always, oh, 
the voice parts sing themselves. Yes. And uh, more than that, it evokes an atmosphere. Um, there are some composers who understand how to make a choir sound. And that's a very hard concept to be more precise about. But some pieces, even by very good composers, no matter how hard you try, never seem to sound quite right. Um, but here's a piece by a composer that we associate mainly with organ music, really. I mean, he wrote reams of it. Yeah. And yet here is a choral piece in a medium that he didn't very often cultivate. He wrote quite a good mass setting. There are probably he lots did. more, but yeah. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm desperate to program the mass. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, it, I'm sure it's buried in a library somewhere. But uh, the ardent leads, um, this uh, light by uns, um, Lord abide with us, yeah. um, for eventide is, is falling, you know, or whatever eventide does. And um, I think it's just got a sound qu not quite like any other. Um, S.S. Wesley, but it also connects with another English might have been composer called Robert Lucas Pearsall, who we know really for just two things. One is his setting of In Dolce Yucalo, yeah. and the other is a lovely magical he wrote called Lay a Garland. Yeah. And this inhabits the same sound world as that piece. And so I think it takes its place these days in the repertoire of choirs everywhere which is really, really nice because history doesn't always do justice to composers. Um, you very rarely get an overvalued composer being sung a hundred years later, but you do get some undervalued ones not being sung. And it's wonderful to be able to bring something like this to the attention of listeners and to choirs everywhere and to hope that they will enjoy it as much as I have. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, John. We'll, uh, you've given us an incredible insight there into into the piece so we'll enjoy it now this is Arbent Lead by Joseph Weinberg
Joseph Reinberger's Arbent League. What a classic of the repertoire. And I think actually there might even be some people here on the chat feed who I might have sung that piece with. Uh, certainly brings back many, many fond memories. And thanks very much to John Rutter for being such a generous man, gem very generous with his time and his knowledge. So thank you for being with us, John. Now, we're coming towards the end of our show today. We're here celebrating the Apple Music Choral Chill playlist, which in its current format has been curated by us, Votchers 8. And at the end of this show, there'll be a link at the bottom of this post so that you can go and check out the playlist. I've played about eight tracks today, and there's 50 tracks on the playlist in total, so much more gold to be mined by you all. We are going to be here again tomorrow. We've got another eight tracks for you by some fantastic artists and some more interviews as well. I'm going to be being joined by Harry Christophers of the 16. Those people in America might also know Harry because he's the conductor of the Handel and Haydn Society in Boston. I've got Robert Hollingworth from E. Fagiolini, Patrick Quigley from Seraphic Fire and Tim Keeler, the new musical director of Chanticleer. And I'll also be catching up with a couple of composers, Jake Runnerstadt from the Twin Cities and also Ola Yellow. So loads to look forward to and I promise you some more beautiful choral music to accompany my chats with those wonderful choral musicians. If you came into this show not from the very beginning, you'd like to watch it back, then it's going to be available on Facebook and YouTube when we finish this stream. So please uh, go back and enjoy some of the gorgeous music. As I say, you can also hear it all on the Apple Music Choral Chill playlist at the moment, and we'll put a link for that. Uh, now, I thought we would finish with a Votchers 8 track, and to talk to us about that, I'm going to catch up with tenor in Voxes 8. The guy who stands has, well, has the bad job, I suppose, because he has to stand next to me. This is Blake. I'm now joined by my colleague from Voxes 8, Blake, our first tenor, who is the arranger of the last piece that we're going to play on today's Apple Coral Chill playlist show. And that song that you arranged is called Caledonia. So do you want to tell us a little bit about it, Blake? Sure. Well, th this is a song I knew as a kid because my best friend Graham gave me a CD of Doogie McLean's music, but it actually wasn't one of my favorite songs in the disc. I had other ones that were my favorites, um, but it's, it's, it's definitely become a piece that's very close to my heart after being asked to arrange it by our record label, Decca, our Decca Classics. And um, so they, they approached me with, with, this, with the tune, and originally I wrote it just for two, uh, well, just what to say, just an acapella version. And then we decided to, to kind of flesh it out and add some, some strings in it. So I was able actually to arrange for, for a string quartet, which is something that I don't I think many people and many arrangers of the group get to do. Um, so that was particularly exciting and it was incredible kind of singing on top of this bed of orchestral uh, chamber sound, you know, well in the session. Um, but it ends in a really interesting way with just Vacha Sait singing. Um, and, I, and that was kind of the, the first thing I wrote was the original, um, just the hymn, a, a oh, hymnal okay. kind of harmonization. Yeah. And that, that came really fast, actually. It's, a, it's kind of the other parts that have all the, all the crazy harmonies that were more difficult to write. So I think you kind of make it through the arrangement, this big climb through the highlands of Scotland and then uh, end with something you sort of earn the the hymn ending actually the whole album as well it's the conclusion to the whole album isn't it you talked about sort of this vision of climbing through the highlands and one of my favorite parts of the arrangement is that I would call it the kind of bridge the key change where it starts nice and low and rises and rises and rises and yeah. finds the new key and it's a real moment of arrival and who should we find when we get to the top but you, you sing the next solo and it's really, really lovely. It's a very, very poignant moment on the CD. So um, I think it's a very appropriate way for us to go out today. So just before we play it, I'd like to say thanks to everybody for joining us today, especially, of course, all of those fantastic guests we've heard from, not just heard from them, but also their brilliant music. So we're going to be back at the same time tomorrow with a second show, meeting a lot of people from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean from where we are now, for people from America. So thanks very much to everyone who's been involved. Thank you for watching. And to go out, we will play Caledonia, sung by Watchers 8 and arranged by Blake Morgan. Let me